All right. So welcome everyone to this uh, very first lecture of the, the week. Um, I would thank Bartek for the introduction, but he already left. Uh, but I'm really happy to, to give these uh, lectures. Uh, so let me tell you what we are going to do in this course. So it's a course about so-called product structure of planar graphs and, and things around it. So first, let me right away state what this product structure uh, thing is. It's, it's the following statement, which hopefully will uh, make perfect sense to all of you at the end of this lecture. So take your favorite planar graph, then there is a choice of a bounded tree with graph H. Tree that most eight, constant H is not important. It has bounded tree with. And a path P, so that when you take the strong product of H and P, you contain your planar graph as a subgraph. Right? So for every planar graph, you can find an H of bounded tree with, a path P, and then your graph is contained in the strong product. Right? So that's uh, the, the product structure that I'm referring to. So first, what is the strong product of two graphs? That's the easiest type of products to, to remember because you put all the edges that make sense. Right? So if you take the product of two paths, you get a grid plus the crosses uh, inside the cells. Uh, say, take another example, take a product of a tree and this path, and now you can, uh, if you are still unsure about the definition, you can see that you have a horizontal copy of the tree for every vertex of the path, you have a vertical copy of the path uh, for every vertex of the tree, and then you have these diagonal edges, right? So more precisely, um, you have an edge between two vertices in the product if in each dimension they map either to a vertex or to an edge. Right? So if I take this diagonal edge here, vertically it maps to an edge, vertically, uh, horizontally it maps to an edge here, so that's an edge. If I take, I don't know, this uh, uh, horizontal edge here, well, vertically it maps to a vertex and uh, horizontally it maps to an edge. Right? So these are the edges of your product. Okay, so the idea of this theorem is that, uh, and I'm reusing some image of Piot here, um, that you have this big complicated planar graph that you care about, and it turns out that it's contained into something that has a simple structure, something that looks like a tree, but the tree width times a path. Right? So that's the, the spirit of this reason. Um, okay, so what are we going to do today? So we are going to prove this theorem, the proof is not uh, difficult. Uh, but before doing that, I will try, because we, we have time here, we have a full week of lectures, I will try to give you some, um, um, sorry, I will try to give you some uh, context and some background from this theorem. So it didn't appear from nowhere, actually the proof is like building on ideas that were in, in uh, earlier results, and they are all in, in, this, in uh, I would say, almost of the same flavor. So I will first start with these earlier results, uh, tell you uh, what, what, they, uh, what we can do with them, and then we will see how the product structure actually appeared in that context. Right? So we spend probably the first half of the lecture today really giving you background on this theorem, and then we will prove it today. And then later on in this week, we are going to see applications, generalizations of this uh, thing. Right? So that's, that will be the theme of this lecture. Okay, so let's you know, start with something simple uh, that's really uh, somehow the beginning of uh, all these ideas. Um, so take a graph, may maybe assume it to be connected, that's not really important. And now we are going to define a notion which is chordal partitions. So what is a chordal partition of a graph? So this makes sense for any graph. Your graph does not have to be planar, but you can define this for any graph. So it's a partition of the vertex set. Right, here we are partitioning into sets that I'm going to call V1, V2, up to some VQ. Uh, and there are two properties that you need to, uh, to satisfy. The first property is that the parts, they must be connected. And the reason, so more precisely, they must induce connected subgraphs. The reason is that we are going to contract these parts, these parts, so the VIs, we are going to contract them each into a vertex. So we are going to take a minor of a graph in this way. Right, so we want the VIs to be connected. And the second property, which is property number two, is that, uh, let me take a chalk if I find one. Ah, here. 
Okay? And the second property is when you look at your parts and you look at some VI, and now you look at the VJs that are before VI and that are adjacent to VI, in the sense that there, there is an edge in between. Say VI sees this set and this set. So by seeing, I mean that VI is connected to a vertex in these two sets by an edge, right? So if VI sees these two sets, then these two sets, they should be adjacent. There should be an edge in between. Okay, so that's the second condition. That's the so-called causality condition. So in other words, when you take a VI and you look at all the VJs that it sees before it, they should be pairwise adjacent. So when you contract each VI into a vertex, it means that the vertex corresponding to VI, what it sees before is a click. Right? So now if you think, in, if you think of your minor where you contract each VI into a vertex, this ordered partition gives you a way to build your minor by, by adding a vertex each time which is adjacent to a click. Right? So when you, you add in your minor the vertex corresponding to VI, you are making it, you are creating this vertex and making it adjacent to a click. And that's exactly a codal graph, right? Codal graphs are exactly the graphs that you can build in this way. By iteratively adding new vertices that you make adjacent to an existing click in your graph. Right, so that's why it's called codal partition. Uh, it's because when you contract each VI into a vertex, you get a codal graph. Does the definition make sense? I'm, I mean, as always, you should feel free to interrupt me if anything is unclear if I'm going too fast, or if I'm going too slow and you're impatient and you want me to, to speed up, that's also fine. Um, okay, so a couple of more definitions and then I will tell you why I want to talk about polar partitions in this context. Um, so I already talked about the minor you get when you contract the VIs into vertices. I'm going to call that the Cauchy graph. So G slash P is what you get when you contract the VIs into vertices. Um, now, it would be important to look at the so-called back degree of some set VI. And that's simply the number of VJs that it sees on the left. Right? So that's the back degree of VI. And as we already mentioned, the discussion graph, it's a coder graph. That's where the name coder partition comes from. A second property that uh, is good to observe is that if you look at this coder graph, which is the minor you get by contracting the VI, you can you can directly see what is the tree width of that graph. Because the tree width of a coda graph is simply the maximum click size minus one. And now if you think of this iterative process of how you're building uh, your coda graph, your minor, you are, each time you're introducing a new vertex that you're making adjacent to a click, right? Now if you think what is the maximum click size in that graph, well, it will happen at some point when you add uh, a vertex in this process. Right, so now maximum click size minus one, what is that? Well, it's exactly the maximum back degree. Right, right so the, the tree width of this minor, this quotient graph, it's exactly the maximum back degree in your caudal partition. Right, so if in your caudal partition you have back degree, uh, maximum back degree two, then your minor has tree width two. Okay? And the well, last observation that we are going to use is well, say that your graph has no complete graph on T vertices as a minor, no KT minor, then the back degrees, they better be at most T minus two. The back degrees are bounded. And well, that's, that should be obvious on the picture because, you know, if when you have a VI and you look at all the VJs that VI sees on the left, this is a model of a complete graph as a minor. Right, so if VI sees T minus one guys on the left, you could contract each into a vertex, plus you contract VI, which is an extra vertex, and you would have a KT as a minor. And if you forbid KT as a minor, that's not happening. So it means that the back degrees there are most T minus two. Okay, so far? Hey. Okay, so we are going to, to use that. So, you know, so far, the notion of caudal partition is it's not that interesting in itself because every graph has a caudal partition. I could just take all vertices and put them into V1 and just have one set V1. 
that's a valid chord partition. It trivially satisfies the, the properties of uh, chord partitions that we have here. I mean, if, assuming that your graph is connected. Um, now, so we need now some measure of how good is the chord partition. In other words, what are we going to try to achieve here? And what we are going to achieve, uh, I mean, the goal will be to get chordal partitions that are somehow flat. So we, are, we want to minimize the flatness of our chordal partition. So let me introduce what, what it is. Uh, the definition might seem a little bit technical at first sight, but with the examples that we are going to see, it will make perfect sense in a few minutes, hopefully. Uh, so to define flatness, I, I need first to talk about the graph at some step in time, at some step i, at some time i. And what do I mean by that? I mean that I look at my chordal partition, and at the beginning I imagine I have the full graph. And then that's time 1. I'll start with uh, v1 here. And then, uh, as I move in time, I'm removing the previous uh, sets. Right? So when at time 2, I remove v1. At time i, I remove v1 up to vi minus 1 from the graph. Right? So that's what I mean by the graph at time i, or at step i. I mean the graph which is induced by vi, vi plus 1 up to the last v. Right? So in other words, I'm removing v1 up to vi minus 1 from the graph. Right? So that's what I mean by the graph at, at time i. And we are going to look at that graph at time i or step i, and we are going to look at shortest paths in that graph. Uh, I'm going to call a shortest path a geodesic here. And so a, sh a path which is shortest at time i, or at step i, I'm going to call that a local geodesic at step i. So why do I say local? Because it's a geodesic in that graph, but it might not be a geodesic of the original graph G. Right? Uh, again, what do I do when I look at local geodesics at step i? Well, I remove first v1, v2 up to vi minus 1. Then I have a bunch of vertices left. I look at that graph. I take a geodesic there. Any path that can appear in this way, I will call a local geodesic uh, at, at step i. It might not be a, a geodesic of the original graph G, because you know, by using some of the vertices I removed, you might have a shortcut. Okay, so that's the notion of local geodesics. And now the notion of flatness is defined using uh, local geodesics. So what you want to do is you want to look at your VI, which is connected, and you want to partition it into as few local geodesics as possible. Right? So you want to partition the vertices uh, into as few local geodesics as possible. So it's really important, it's the vertices. You just want to partition the vertex sets into local geodesics. Right, so you want to see vi as, I don't know, you have some local geodesic here, another here, uh, I don't know, something like that. Maybe I use three geodesics, I, I don't know, three local geodesics. Uh, but you, you want to use as few local geodesics as possible. And now the flatness of your chordal partition is like the maximum number of local geodesics you're going to use in that game, right? So it's the minimum S so that you can always partition VI into at most S Sorry. local geodesics. Yes, please. What do you mean by a path? Because an empty path wide is not always the shortest. Uh, so by a path, I, I simply mean a path between two vertices in the graph, and those two vertices not, need not be distinct, right? So a single vertex is considered so as a why, path. Why path in the short Shortest between two fixed vertices. Yes. Oh. Oh, thank you. Yes. I, I, thanks. Thanks. Yes. OK, so what, what I should have emphasized that thanks for this remark. So shortest path, I will, I'm sorry, I'll just after. So shortest path, by shortest path, I mean I take two vertices and I take a shortest path in between these two vertices. Right? These two vertices need not be distinct. If they are the same, well, that's a trivial shortest path. It's just a single vertex. There was another question there. Yes, because you draw all the paths in this bag uh, VI, but the vertices, they can also be in other bags, no? Okay, so... Um, you are looking at the graph at step i, 
and uh, so you, have, you cannot use vertices from before. So definitely in your geodesics you cannot use uh, vertices from before, but I should have emphasized it on the slide that your local geodesic should be completely inside VI. Right, so it's a really a partition of VI and you're staying inside VI, right? So, so. so in other words, VI is connected, but it's actually, it has a stronger property. It has been made up of uh, these local geodesics. And there is always such a partition because, you know, it's connected. Worst case, you take every edge and that's, uh, that's a local geodesic. Uh, so you can always build uh, such a partition, but the game is that you really want to minimize the number of geodesics. So once again, you look at your VI and you want to partition the vertices into paths and each path should be a local geodesic at step i. But it's completely into VI, this path. We are going to see some proofs and, this, uh, the, and we are going to build these VIs by, by uh, unions of geodesics. So if anything is unclear, I hope this uh, will give you uh, the clarification you need. Any more questions? So, yes. And the name, why flat? I mean, I don't see it right away. Like, um, yeah, so that comes from a 2016 paper. Uh, I, I don't know why they call it flat. <laughs> we should ask authors. Is there an author in the room? I, I don't think so, no. Okay. I mean, the names will be on the, on the next few slides, so, but I, I don't think any author is here. Yeah, so I don't have a good answer. <laughs> Okay, um, feel free to interrupt as always and let me proceed. Right, so we have this notion of flatness. It looks a bit technical right now. Huh? We are not completely sure what's the point of it. It will make some sense soon. Uh, what I would like to note also is that if you look in the literature, there are different names for, for these notions. And sometimes when you look at codal partitions where you bound the flatness, this is sometimes called a flat decomposition. So that's another name for it. Okay, so let me start right away with a, a theorem that we are going to prove about codal partitions with small flatness. And it's a theorem that you know, has been uh, discovered at least twice. It's implicit in a 1986 paper of Andrei uh, that was about the cops and rubber game on a graph that forbid KT as a minor. And you know, he didn't state that theorem explicitly, but if you look at the proof, the, the theorem is inside, it's implicit in the proof. And you are going to, to, uh, to prove it. The cops and rubber application, you are going to do it at the exercise session today. Uh, so, and then these authors uh, there in 2016, and I think nobody's here, right? No. <laughs> um, they, they made it explicit. Um, and then, okay. Uh, so what does this theorem say? It says that take your favorite KT minor free graph, then there is a codal partition of your graph um, with flatness very small, at most t minus 3. Right, the minus 3 is not really important, so just think flatness at most t if you, if you want. But uh, there, if you forbid KT as a minor, then you have a codal partition with small flatness. And once you have that, well, there are, there are applications of this. There are different theorems that you can prove uh, using uh, this. Uh, in particular, you can bound some graph invariants using this, including the so-called weak coloring numbers, whatever, whatever these are. This will appear in Piotr's lecture uh, maybe tomorrow. Um, so, you know, when you see weak coloring numbers in Piotr's lecture, you can think, okay, one way to, be, to bound the actually, the only known way to bound uh, weak growing numbers on KT minor free graphs is using these codal partitions. Okay, so there are different applications of it. You are going to see some in the exercise session. But now, let me prove this. So there is always a codal partition with uh, small flatness, at most uh, T minus 3. And we are going to build the codal partition one set at a time, starting with V1, V2, V3, etc. Uh, V1, the way we are going to initialize the proof is that we are just putting an arbitrary vertex in V1. That's fine, this is connected. Uh, there is not much to check. But we are going to maintain a stronger property at each step to make the induction go true. And the stronger property we are going to maintain is this star property here. So let's parse it. 
And this property will appear over and over again in this lecture today in, in various forms. And, at, and, this, and by modifying this property, you get different theorems, and at the end, you will get the product structure theorem by modifying this. Okay, so uh, this is the motivation for me to talk about this. So what is this star property? Well, look at some time step, some graph at step i. So I remove v1 up to vi minus 1. And what we want there is that if you look at that graph and you look at any connected component d of that graph, you look at the vj's that are already defined that your connected component sees, then the, these vj's should be pairwise adjacent. Okay, so let me uh, illustrate this. So the idea is that you defined already a bunch of sets and you stopped at vi minus 1 and the property says well now if you look at any connected component in the graph induced by the vertices that are not in those parts and if you look at the vj's that your connected component sees so I don't know, maybe it's this one and this one, then they should be pairwise adjacent. Right? So this is the property we want for VI, but what we are going to maintain is that this property is true for any connected component of the current graph at step one. Right? So this is the star property. So what we are going to do to prove this is we are going to use this property to build our VI, and then once we build our VI, we are going to make sure that this property holds at the next time step, right? So then uh, the, the proof goes through. So how do we do this? Well, I look at my... So I define v R, V1 up to VI minus 1 so far. And I want to build my VI. Right? I want to make one step. So I look at any connected component of the current graph at time i. Okay, I will repeat one last time the definition. Current graph at time i means that you remove v1 up to vi minus 1. I'm looking at some connected component, any, pick your favorite. I'm picking this one. Now look at the vj's that it sees. Uh, so in this picture, it sees two, maybe, um, let's modify a little bit. Maybe it sees this, this. And this. Maybe it sees these three sets here. And for each set that is seen by D on the left, I pick an exit point. So this is a vertex of your component that sends an edge to a VG to the left. Right? So if I see K guys on the left, I'm picking at most K exit points. Why do I say at most? Because, you know, same vertex here could see multiple VGs on the left. That's fine. But I'm definitely picking at most k uh, guys if I have like degree k for my component. Okay, so what do I do next? Well, now I remember what I want to achieve. What I want to achieve is that the VI I'm building is made up of a small number of local geodesics. So geodesics in the current graph. Right? So, you know, just let's build VI by using a few geodesics. Right, so I'm, I'm playing in the current graph, I'm playing in this uh, graph um, in this, connect, uh, this connected component D and I'm just going, I'm just going to start with an exit point and I'm going to hook up these exit points using geodesics in D. Right, so I start with this one and I take a geodesic to any other exit point, maybe this one. And then, as long as I still have a new exit point to, uh, to hook up, I, I connect it to it. Right? So my, now I start from here, and I want to hook, hook up this exit point. I take a geodesic, maybe the beginning shares some part with the previous one, that's fine. And then I, I, hook, up the next I, I hook up the next exit point, etc., etc. Right? So if I have k exit points, by using k minus 1 local geodesics, I can beat my VR. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. I make this 
by new VR. By the way, one thing I should emphasize, but it's probably clear, is that the, your VI that you're building, it's made up of a, a small number of geodesics. But you might have edges in between some of these geodesics right. in the graph. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean this joint. Thanks for the correction. It's made up of a small number of geodesics. But you might have some edges in the graph between distinct geodesics. That's completely fine. Right? That's, this could happen, right? You could have two geodesics running in parallel and having edges in the graph between. You, you, I, you don't care about that. Right? You just want to say that the vertex set of your VI can be partitioned into a small number of geodesics. OK, so that's how you define your new VI. OK, so let's check that the properties of chordal partitions are satisfied so far. Yes, there is a question. That is, that is forming a tree always if you contract the edges with the geodesic. Sorry, you could you repeat? So uh, is, does that always form a tree-like structure? Yeah, I mean, if you make it canonically, I guess uh, it would be, uh, it would define a tree. I mean, this is actually not important. What's important is that it's connected. Um, okay. You can always make it a tree by taking the current tree and taking a shortest path to the next next guy uh, from this tree, the whole this tree. To right. The next guy. Yes. Thanks. Yes. So there is a smart way of doing it. In which case, it gives you a tree. Um, yeah. yeah. Also, yeah. in that case, you can have extra edges because the attachment point could go to. Yeah, I mean, induced it will not be a tree, yeah, yes. but uh, the subgraph that you actually Yes. Yeah, so again, if you just look at the paths, then it would be together, if you do it in a smart way, it would define a tree, but this is not an induced subgraph, right? You might have edges running in between distinct branches of your tree, that's completely fine, it's an un unavoidable. Um, thanks for this remark, Miho. So, uh, so yes. sorry if I disjoined this conversation. So, so I do believe that if it's done in the Michaels way, you can actually partition of the vertex set in, in uh, geodesics. I don't see it like in, in your way. Am I overseeing, overlooking something? Or Because you keep saying partition, and for me partition means that the, the set, subsets of vertices are disjoint. Mm -hmm. And what, what, what I have a problem with how you, you describe it is that basically these geodesics like you may take a part of one, leave, maybe visit another of already, and, and then I don't see like the, the, the bound. You're right, so you're completely right. So let's take Michal's, uh, <laughs> Michal's version that would be much better. So what we care about is actually not partitioning, it's covering with a small number of uh, geodesics. And in, in this case, this is fine. But since I mentioned partitions, Michal's way is much better. So could you repeat that? So let me repeat that. So the, the process is the following, that you, so far you hooked up a bunch of uh, exit points together in a, in a tree made up of some unions of geodesics. And as, as long as you have some exit points which is not in your tree, it's from that exit point you take a shortest path to the tree that you are building. Right? So you end up somewhere in that tree and then you stop and then you hooked up a new uh, exit point to that tree. Does that make sense? Thanks a lot for these remarks. Very good. Okay. Um, so, we built our VI using um, a small number of geodesics. That's uh, all good. So, why is it at most t minus 3? Well, it's because, you know, the graph is kt minus 3 and we are building a chordal partition and we know that every chordal partition of a kt minus 3 graph has back degree at most t minus 2. So the number of exit points is at most t minus 2. And so the number of geodesics that you are using is one less than the back degree. So it's uh, at most t minus 3. OK, so let's check that all the properties we want are satisfied. Well, OVI is definitely connected. We already talked about the fact that it's made up of a small number of geodesics at most t minus 3. Uh, what about? The, f the caudality part. Well, this one is, is directly satisfied because the VJs that are seen by your VI on the left are exactly the VJs that were seen by your connected component D. 
And thanks to the style property, we know that they are pairwise adjacent. Right? So this property gives you right away that your VI, uh, well, in the VJs that are seen by your VI on the left, they are pairwise adjacent. So that is fine. So of course, the main thing we have to check is that this property still holds after you define VI. So let's check that. Okay, so now I just define VI, you know, and I have a new uh, current graph. I don't think there are color show. Ah, there is a blue here. And when you look at the, the new current graph, and you look at the new connected components, well, you have some of the old connected components, but in D, when you remove VI, this splits up possibly in a number of uh, connected components. Right, so now I'm looking at time i plus one, step i plus one, meaning that I remove v1 up to vi. And I'm looking at any connected component there, and I want to make sure that this property is satisfied. Okay, so if I look at one of these components that were already a component before, then the property is satisfied simply because it was before. These components, they don't see VI that we just defined. So they see a bunch of VJs before. And they are pairwise adjacent because thanks to the property star before, we knew that they were pairwise adjacent. So what we need to make sure is what, what's happening for these new components that are the leftovers of D when you remove VI. Thanks. Right, so I remove my VI, this splits up D into a bunch of components. And now these are the components that I need to uh, worry about. So let's look at any of these components. These components, they obviously see VI, right? Because D was connected, VI is connected, and you know, these components, they, 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 uh, they should see uh, VI. So they see VI, and you know, they see some VJs, I don't know which one. Maybe they see these two. But the point is that all the VJs that are seen by such a component, let's call it the prime, they were already seen by D at the previous step. Right? So all these guys here, all these VJs before VI that are seen by that component, they were seen by D. And so by the property of the previous step, we know that these ones are pairwise adjacent. So now we have to, to check what happens uh, between these ones and VI. Well, the way we built VI, we know that VI sees all of, the, all of the VJs that were seen by D on the left. So in particular, VI sees these ones. Right? So VI sees these ones, so they are all pairwise adjacent, so the property is satisfied for D prime. Right? So this stronger property is maintained at each step, so this is a valid way of building uh, your cordial partition. And uh, we made it in such a way that each, at each step the new VI is made up of a small number of uh, geodesics. Uh, T minus 3 is not really important, just think T, uh, remember T, that's uh, good enough for what we want to do. We are going to use this at the exercise session. Uh, but this is, really the f I mean, this is really the first proof in this uh, direction, in this research direction. Okay, so now, okay, I, I see that I actually uh, put some illustration of it. So, okay, let me quickly do an, uh, one application. I mean, it's not something, it's not a new result, it's just a way, I just put this slide so that you see how to use caudal partitions for kt minor free graphs, and we are going to see other example, examples uh, in the exercise session. Okay, so it's just for illustration. So, okay, so let's look at the Hadwiger's conjectures, right? So, you forbid kt as a minor, you want to color it with at most t minus one colors. That's Hadwiger's conjecture, generalizes the four color theorem. Um, so if, if you have been looking at uh, Hadwiger's conjecture, you probably did the easy exercise of showing that it's bounded by some function of t, the chromatic number. Right, so the question is, what's the best bound on the chromatic number you can put if you forbid kt as a minor? And showing that it's bounded by a function of t is not difficult. There is an easy inductive proof that gives you an exponential bound to, to the t. And if you want to get better bound, which is what lots of people have been working on during the years, well, you can use uh, a density bound. If you forbid kt as a minor, you have average degree at most t root log t up to a constant factor. 
And then, you know, you can take a vertex of minimum degree, so degree at most that, remove it, color inductively the graph that's left, and color the, the vertex that you just removed, and then you would use at, at most that many colors. That was the best known bound for a while, and then two years ago, uh, there was a big breakthrough by Noring, Song, and joined by Postel, uh, where they, they, they got a better bound on the chromatic number. There were lots of improvements. I'm skipping all that history. But for your information, the best known bound right now is T log log T, constant factor of time T log log T, due to Delcourt and, and Postel. Okay, we are not going to show any of these. These are complicated proofs. Uh, but let me just show you that the, the, what we did on the previous slide, it, it quickly implies a T squared bound for the chromatic number of KT minus 3 graphs. And uh, as far as I know, this is the easiest proof of a polynomial bound uh, for, for the chromatic number. Okay, so how do we do it? Take the caudal partition for your KT minus 3 graph from the previous slide. Okay? The first thing that we are going to observe is that if you look at one vi, one set vi here, for instance, then the graph induced by your vi, you can color it with big O of t colors, at most two t colors, let's say. Well, why is that? Well, think of the process of how vi was built. First, you took a geodesic between two vertices, a local geodesic, but a geodesic at uh, which which is an induced path, right? That path, you can color it with two colors. And then, at, iteratively, you hook up uh, a new exit point, each time with a, a shortest path to the, the current tree that we are drawing. This shortest path to the current tree, it's an induced path, so you can color it with two new colors. Right, and we, we do this at most t times, so, you know, with two t colors, I'm, forgetting about some minuses here, you, you can color uh, VI, the, the graph induced by VI. Right, so these, these VIs, the, the graph induced by the VIs, they have chromatic number at uh, most 2T. Okay, but now that we have this caudal partition, there is a, an obvious T squared upper bound, because, you know, you color your graph uh, from left to right by looking at your VIs. <coughs> Right, so when you need to color VI, when well, you look at the VJs that it sees on the left, it sees at most T minus two of them, so let's say at most T. Each of these VJs have been colored using, say, at most two T colors each. So there are at most two T v uh, at most T VJs that you see on the left, each one uses at, at most two T colors. So you are forming essentially two T squared colors. And now you color your VI, right? So using, uh, order of 2t squared colors, you can uh, color your graph in this way and you get a, a polynomial bound. Okay, that's just a, some illustration of what you can do with uh, color partitions. Make sense? Okay, great. Uh, let me have a look at the time. Okay, so that was for KT minor free graphs and somehow this is the beginning of the story. But what we are going to focus on in this course is we are going to look at planar graphs and some classes of graphs that are really close to planar. And somehow the, the next step in the story is that some people ask themselves how can we improve the result for KT minor free graphs, so the result for coda partitions, how can we make it better for planar graphs? That's the next step. So if you have a planar graph, so G now is a planar graph, it's K5 minus 3, so you could apply the previous result. So there is a caudal partition, you have flatness at most T minus 3, so at most 2, and you have back degrees at most T minus 2, so this is at most 3. Uh, the back degrees, they give you the, the tree read of your quotient graph, so the quotient graph has tree read at most 3. Right, so if you apply the previous result, that's what you get. But now what people did is that they observed that Essentially, you can improve all these bounds here. So these two, three, and three, you can improve all of them essentially by one. Yes, so essentially, you can make sure that the, the quotient graph has to read two, and your flatness will be at most one, but actually it will be exactly one. So flatness one means, flatness one means that each VI is just one geodesic, okay? So that's essentially uh, the, the next step. So just improving these bounds. 
So you might say, okay, well, why is it interesting just to improve the bounds? Well, in some cases, the, the, the theorems you prove, they depend on these bounds, so that's one motivation. But a second motivation is that the proof that we are going to see uh, is going to be modified to eventually give you the proof of the product structure theorem. So that's uh, why I really want to tell you about it. Okay, so this theorem has been rediscovered at least uh, three times. It's implicit in an old paper of, about the cups and rubber game on thermographs. Uh, it's explicit in a paper of Paul from 1990. We didn't know apparently about this previous paper and was re rediscovered yet again by these authors in 2016. Uh, we made it uh, completely explicit somehow. Okay, so let's pass the, the statement first. Um, first, there is a, a small technical detail, is that I'm not going to look at any planar graph. Uh, to simplify my life, I'm going to look at plane triangulations. Okay? This, this won't hurt us, but from, the, from, the, from now on, think of G as being a plane triangulation. Okay, so I have a plane triangulation, then the theorem says that you have a caudal partition, so that, well, all the bounds are one less than on the previous slide. So you have flatness one, so each VI is a local geodesic. The back degrees are at most two, right? So the, your minor will have a, a three with at most two. How do we prove this? Well, we run the previous proof, but we are going to strengthen a bit this star property that we maintain at each step, right? This property of the components and uh, the VJs that about these components and the VJs that are seen by this component. Right, so we, we build the VIs uh, inductively and the property that we are going to maintain is looks a bit technical at first sight. It's all of this. So let me illustrate it on the board. And you will see that it's quite uh, easy to picture. <laughs> So we are going to maintain the following property. At each step i in time, if you look at any connected component of the current graph, I'm looking at some component b in the current graph, then you should be able to find in your graph a cycle c which uh, surrounds it. So there should be a cycle in your graph, and this cycle has two properties. It's made up of two paths, one that uh, belongs to some previous VJ, let me call it VJ1, and the second one to another previous uh, VJ, and then you have these two extra edges in between. Okay, so let me repeat it again. The property that we are going to maintain is that if you look at any time step i, and i will be at least three, we are not going to look at the first two time steps. You look at any connected component d of the graph at time i, then you should be able to find a cycle c in your graph g that surrounds your connected component. And by surrounds, I mean that your, comp your component D is actually the graph induced by all the vertices strictly inside C. Right? So D is actually the subgraph induced by all the vertices that are strictly inside C. And now we are using topology. Right? There is a notion of inside and outside. So I'm looking at all the vertices uh, drawn inside. I'm looking at the graph induced by them. And this should be your D. Right? And this cycle C should have two more properties. One that I did not mention uh, yet is that it should be a cordless cycle, no cords. And the second property is that there should be a way to partition the cycle into two parts, each of which belongs to a previous VJ that you define. Right? So in other words, for the, your component that you're looking at, there is a VJ1 and a VJ2 that appears in this way 
on the boundary of uh, the, the cycle. It might not be the full VJ, right? The, 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 the VJ can extend, but actually the, the portion here actually belongs to a previous VJ. Right? So it might seem like a, a technical definition, but we are going to, you know, we are going to modify this setup uh, uh, multiple times in this lecture. So let me make sure that it's completely clear, right? So once again, I'm looking at the step in time i, i is at least three. I'm looking at any connected component of the current graph. So I delete v1 up to vi minus one. For each connected component d, there should be a cycle c, so that d is exactly the graph induced by the vertices inside, c is codeless, and c is can be partitioned into exactly two parts, each of which belongs to a previous VG. Okay. So, so, so yes. Sorry, uh, yes. Asking this. So this C is not necessarily part of the component D, or is never part of the component? It's never part of, because D is really used by what is strictly drawn inside. Yeah? So C is, com is outside D, no vertex in common with D, and D is really in the code the graph induced by uh, all the vertices uh, that are drawn strictly inside, see? And here we are using that uh, it's a plane triangulation, by the way, because in a plane triangulation, if you take a cordless cycle, you look at all the vertices which are strictly inside, and you look at what's uh, induced by that, that's connected. Right, so, um, okay, so I have this cordless cycle, you look at what's strictly inside, uh, this, is, this induces a connected graph, and this should be your com component. Okay, my cordless cycle should be made up of two paths plus two extra edges connecting them, and these two paths they belong to previous VJs. Make sense? Again, it might seem technical. Now that we are going to do the proof, hopefully it will uh, make uh, some sense. Right. So on the slide, when I write int of C, I really mean the proper interior of. Uh, the uh, the region bounded by by the cycle C. Okay, so that's what I, I want to maintain at each step. But I did not say how we start the process. Right, this is a property we want to maintain for every i at least three. But this, you know, it's an inductive proof. We better start the process in a correct way. So let me just you know do it on the side. How do we start the process? Well, it's a plane triangulation. I look at the outer triangle. Everything else is inside. I make this my V1. I make this my V2. Right? V1 and V2 are connected. They are local geodesics at their respective times. And uh, what about the star property when, when I look at i equal to 3? This is the only time step I need to check because this is about i at least 3. When, when I look at time 3, I remove v1 and v2, but I have only one connected component, which is everything inside. And that connected component sees v1 and v2. And you have the cycle that uh, we want to have. Well, in this case, it's a very short cycle, right? It's this outer triangle. But it can be partitioned into two parts, each of which belongs to previous VJs. And you have these two connecting edges. Right, so at least the machine starts, right? So the, the, it's, a, the, it's a good start. So now let's check the inductive step. So to, to, make, to do the inductive step, well, we define V1 up to VI minus one, and we need to define VI. We know that this star property holds right now. We are going to define VI, and we are going to make sure that the star property holds uh, still holds afterwards, right? Still, exactly the same uh, uh, framework as in the previous one. So, okay, I look at some component D at step I. I have the corresponding cycle C that surrounds it. And now I need to do one step. I need to define a new VI. Now I'm going to look at these two edges here, these two special edges. It's a plane triangulation. I'm going to use that again. Each of these edges is in the boundary of two facial triangles, one inside and one outside. I'm not going to look at the facial triangle inside. So remember that D is inside here. 
on removing this box. Okay, I look at facial triangle inside. Now, the third vertex, I drew it strictly inside. But you might object and say, well, why isn't the third vertex, you know, on, on one of these two parts? <laughs> and the reason it's not, it's because it's a cordless cycle. Right? So the, the third vertex is really inside. We need that. Right? So the third vertex is inside. Now I'm doing the same for this other edge here. I'm going to get the third vertex of the fissure triangle inside. Might be the same vertex, by the way. That's completely fine. Okay, what do I do now? Now, well, I take in my component D, I take a shortest path in between. That's a local geodesic at step I, right? <laughs> and I make that my new VI. How do you know that shortest path doesn't intersect the top or the bottom part? It doesn't because I'm looking at a shortest path in D, okay. and D is the graph induced by everything strictly inside. So again, the boundary does not play, it's just around, but it does not play when I take my shortest path. Thanks for the Yes, why D is connected? Okay, so that's a property of plane triangulations, that if you take a cordless cycle, uh, and you look at all the vertices strictly inside, this is induced uh, a connected uh, graph. You, you want me to do this proof or maybe sketch it? It, it sounds, uh, sounds positive. Okay, let me try to not do a full proof, but just sketch it. Would that be okay? So the sketch would be... Okay, let me think. Picture your product cycle. Now, look at the graph induced by what's strictly inside. By contradiction, assume it's not connected. You have a bunch of connected components. Right? Now, for each connected component, you are going to do the following thing. You are going to look at your connected component and you are going to iteratively contract edges until each connected component uh, uh, drops down to a single vertex. When you do these edge contractions, it's still a plane triangulation. When you contract an edge in plane triangulation, you will stay a plane triangulation. So now what you have is that you still have your cordless cycle, but inside you have a bunch of vertices, which in the graph, strictly inside, are in an, is an independent set. Right? But these vertices, they are connected to the other side, of course. Okay, now we are going to see that actually there is a phase bigger than three. Uh, why is that? Well, let me do it quickly. Uh, here. So, call the cycle C, and now I'm looking at one of these components that resulted in a, a vertex when I contracted it. And I, now I look at its neighbors on the cycle C. As a bunch of neighbors, at least three, you know, because plane triangulations are tri-connected. It, it should have at least three neighbors. And, you know, it divides the, the interior into regions. Um, <coughs> uh, right, so let's look at any region, for instance, this one. And now you're going to ask, well, do I have anything here? And I, it's a sketch, right? Um, so, if I don't have any other vertices here, then this is a, a facial triangle because your, your, your uh, cycle is, uh, is cordless. So, you cannot have a cord like this and another thing. Right? So, uh, if you don't have any other vertices here, then this is actually a facial triangle. But now, if you, have, if you have multiple components, then there, there will be a region where you will have at least one of the vertex. And this is just a sketch now, this, this should tell you that this face is bigger than three in size. Okay, I'm hand waving because I don't want to uh, spend too much time here, but I, I think that's the idea. Is that somehow convincing? Or? Yes. Okay, hopefully. Uh, we, we can discuss it offline if, uh, if yes. you want, but I think that's, that should be the reason. Okay, um, where was I? Yes, uh, so I, I had these two uh, facial triangles here. And then I had this 
two extra vertices. I hook them up using uh, uh, a local geodesic, and that's my new VR. And now I need to check that, you know, that was a good step. All the properties that I care about are satisfied. Well, first, my VI was built by doing one local geodesic, so the flatness part is fine, right? It's built using one local geodesic. Uh, the two VJs it sees are exactly the two VJs in blue here, and they are adjacent thanks to these edges. So the caudal part is fine. Um, now, what about this star property? This is the, the, the important one that we need to check. We need to check that it still holds. So we are going to look at the graph at time i plus 1. And we are all going to look at any connected component there. And we are going to make sure that this property holds. So you give me some connected component d prime at time i plus 1. And I'm going to ask, where is this component? Is it drawn inside c? Or is it drawn outside c? Right, so I removed v1 up to vi. So in particular, I removed all the vertices of c. So your connected component should be either inside or outside. <laughs> if it's outside, you give me some connected component defined outside, then whatever business I did there had no influence. Right? And we know at the previous step that D prime <laughs> satisfied this property and it will still satisfy it because this has no influence on some cycle bounding uh, D prime. Okay? So the in interesting case is, that is when you look at some D prime which is drawn inside here. So where could D prime be? Well, it's definitely not here, because that's a facial triangle. That's a facial triangle as well. But uh, it will be here or here. OK, without loss of generality, let's assume it's here. That's my D prime. OK, now I have small technicality, not very important. You might have edges between this path and this path. You might have some chords in between. Let's draw some. Maybe one like this, maybe one like this. So you actually this splits up that top part into a bunch of subregions. But now that we took all the calls into account, this naturally defines some cordless cycles bounding each of these regions. Right? And D prime will be in one of them. And each such uh, cycle is can be partitioned into two parts each belonging to previous VJ, namely VI and, in this case, VJ1. VJ right? And these are called the cycles because, I mean, I put all the calls into my picture. Is that convincing? OK, so the. Could it be that D prime does not see VJ, the, the upper path? Well, it's a triangulation, so it will see. If it were not a triangulation, uh, that could be uh, that could be a case. Yes. Yes. So there is a version of this theorem where you actually run the proof not on a triangulation, and then what you get is not a codal partition; it's something a bit more loose. And and then because of these technicalities, you actually have uh, you have to be a bit more careful. But for triangulations, it's it's, it's all fine. OK, are we happy with that? OK, so you know, what, what is the ID, the new ID here? The new ID is to have this bounding cycle, this surrounding cycle that is split up in a small number of parts that belong to previous widgets. And that's the idea that we are going to reuse over and over again. OK, now the next step is a really big step that was made by Niho and uh, Sebastian Siebert in 2018, they, they proved the following theorem by modifying this very proof that I just described. Um, and we are going to see how. And they proved the following theorem. So take any planograph, then there is a way to partition the vertices. It's not a caudal partition, but caudal partitions will be there in the proof. But in the statement, it's not about caudal partitions. So now it's just just a regular vertex partition. So there is a way to partition your vertices into sets, v1 up to vq. Each set uh, is connected, each vi is connected, but moreover, it's a global geodesic. So it's the shortest path between two vertices in the original graph G. 
right? So each vi is a path in G, and that path is the shortest path in G between these two endpoints. And there is a way to get such a vertex partition in such a way that the Gaussian graph has small tributary that most eight. Right, so imagine that your graph G, in orange, these are the geodesics that you used for uh, defining your vertex partition, and that would be your Gaussian graph, which has small trivia. Does the theorem make sense? Right? So we are losing caudal, the caudality of the partition. That, that's fine, it will reappear in the proof. Don't worry about it. Um, but the, the big uh, difference be, be between this proof, uh, this theorem and the previous theorems is that the VIs, they are global geodesics, they are not local geodesics at some time step. And that's what they needed actually to, to prove, uh, uh, to bound some parameters on pedagraphs. They really wanted to have global geodesics and that, that's, why, that's why they proved it. We are going to see a proof of that. Um, but what I wanted to say is that once you, this is really close to the so-called product structure that I already mentioned at the beginning. So let me recall what is the statement of the product structure. The statement is that for every planar graph, you have some graph H of three at most eight. So you see it's the same bound on three with, that's not an accident. Uh, and you have some path P so that your planar graph is contained in the strong product of H and P. And the proof of this is really a small tweak of the proof uh, uh, of the theorem above. And now what I'm going to do now with the time left, ah, okay, I have enough time, um, is to prove the following technical theorem. And this theorem, as we, we are going to see in a minute, it implies the two previous theorems. So it implies the product structure and it implies the theorem about uh, partitioning your planar graphs into geodesics so that you have bounded tree within the Gaussian graph. So the theorem this technical theorem is the following. Say that you have a connected planar graph. Uh, connected is not too important, but it's because we want to have a, a spanning tree. Um, <coughs> take any spanning tree of your graph, root it at some vertex, so you have a rooted spanning tree. When you have a rooted tree, there is a, with the root on top, uh, there is a natural notion of vertical paths. That's a path starting from a vertex and climbing up in the tree towards the root and stopping at some point, right? So any path in the tree that looks like this is called a vertical path, a vertical path. So a path in the tree that would not be a vertical path is a path that makes a bend. Okay, so we are going to be interested in vertical paths in, my, in our rooted span tree. And the theorem says that if you have any connected planar graph in any rooted spanning tree, then there is a vertex partition. Again, it's just a vertex partition, not a colder partition, uh, of your graph into vertical paths, so that the cushion graph has three at most eight. Right, so it looks a lot like the first theorem, but the difference is that we are not partitioning into geodesics, in, uh, but we are partitioning into these uh, vertical paths which are defined with respect to some rooted spanning tree. Okay, so how do we get the two previous theorems as a corollary of this theorem? So this is what we are going to prove uh, today, but why, is it, why does it imply the previous theorems? So the first one you get by taking your spanning tree, you take it to be a breadth search tree from some vertex. Right, that's, that's your rooted spanning tree. So if your tree is a VFS tree, and you look at any vertical path, then that's a uh, shortest path between the two endpoints. That's a global geodesic. Right, so in that case, the vertical path, they are geodesics of G. So in that case, you get the first uh, theorem by taking a breadth search tree. Um, how do you get the second one? Well, you again, you again take T to be a breadth search tree, and we are going to see that the product structure appears naturally. And by the way, I should mention that you know when you see this statement, it might be tempting to you know try to play with it and use something which is not a breadth search tree and hope to have something interesting. And we tried, a bit, we played a bit around with, with that, and we <coughs> never got anything interesting by using something which is not a breadth search tree. So it might be that you know this is only interesting when T is a breadth search tree. But at least the proof works for any spanning tree. So how do you get the the, the product structure? 
Uh, so again, my spanning tree is a breadth search tree. And for the product structure, I need to define H and P. Right? H, my bounded tree with graph, P, my path. So H, that's easy. This will be the quotient graph that I get when I contract each of my uh, paths in my partition, each of my vertical paths into the vertex. Right? This is my quotient graph. I draw it horizontally here. Now what about P? Well, P, it will model the layers of my BFS tree. I have one vertex in P for every uh, layer in my BFS. So the first, the top vertex of P will correspond to the root of my BFS, next vertex to all the vertices and distance one, etc. Right? And now I claim that when, if, if you make this choice for H and P, then your planar graph is contained into the strong product of these two graphs. Well, to, to check this claim, what you need to do is you need to check that every edge of your planar graph maps to a vertex or an edge in each of the two dimensions. Right? This is how you check that your that your edge is there in the strong product. So let's look that let's look at that. So you have two types of edges in G. You have edges that belong to one of these paths that you contract to create edge. These edges in a range in this picture. Well, these edges, they obviously map to a vertex in H, right? Because they are part of some path that you contracted to a vertex. So they definitely map to a vertex in H. And well, you know, they go between two consecutive layers, so they definitely map to an edge in P. Right? So they, these edges are there in the product. Now, what about edges of G which are not of this type? So the blue edges on this picture. So these blue edges, these edges, these uh, said they are UV edges. They are of the form U is sitting on one of the paths that you contracted, and V is sitting on another path that you contracted. But when you did this contraction to define your minor edge, if you had an edge between two vertical paths that you contracted, the edge is staying between the resulting vertices. Right? So such a blue edge like this one here, it naturally maps to uh, an edge in H. Because that's, we just contracted. <laughs> Uh, paths and the edge in between says. Right, so it maps to an edge in H. What about in P? Well, now it depends how this edge looks like. If it's in between two consecutive layers, then it maps to an edge of P. If it's a horizontal edge, like this one here, then it will map to a vertex of P. In all possible cases, it's part of the product. Right? You're all convinced by that? Because this is how the, the product appears. Yes? OK, so again, we see that this technical looking statement, if you take your spanning tree T to be a breadth of such tree, it implies these two, uh, these two theorems. And now, if there are no further questions, I suggest that we, we prove it. This could be the, the end of the, the lecture. Um, OK, so we want to prove this. We have a connected plane graph. Uh, we have some rooted spanning tree T, and we want to partition the vertices into vertical paths so that the Cauchy graph has smooth tree. So um, I did a, a big case of bait and switch. I just convinced you that this was interesting to prove, and what I'm going to show is uh, the following variant of it. Okay, so we are going to actually prove this thing. You see there are some differences in the statement. This might look uh, a bit, uh, I don't know, uh, strange. But once you've seen the proof of this, you are going to see that the previous statement is a corollary of this. Right? So we are going to prove this, and this is really the heart of the proof. And the, the previous theorem is actually just a consequence of this. But it's better that we see the proof of this, uh, and then once we, you see the proof, you will see that. Uh, the previous theorem really follows from it. Okay, so let's let's pass this uh, statement. And codal partitions are back in this statement. So that's a nicer statement to prove. We are going to build codal partitions again. We are going to modify this proof. So we take a plane triangulation. We prefer plane triangulations. Uh, this is nice. We still have a rooted spanning tree. Um, and now the statement says that when well, you have a codal partition, I believe these usual codal partitions, 
But now the VIs, they have a very specific form. They are so-called tripods. Right, so each VI will be a tripod in your codon partition. So there is a codon partition into tripods so that when you look at the cushion graph, you have three that means three. Okay, so what is a tripod? So remember that we are in a plane triangulation. A tripod consists of, of a base, which is a triangle, and it's a facial triangle, so that's a face. And it has three branches. And each of these branches, they just go out of each vertex of your triangle, and they are vertical paths in your uh, rooted spanning tree. So again, tripod is take a facial triangle, and then from each vertex, just shoot three vertical paths up uh, in the tree uh, towards the root. Any such thing is a tripod. This is a subgraph. It's not an induced subgraph. Right? So this is the notion of tripod is just a subgraph. What I mean by that is that in the graph you might have edges, you know, between uh, between uh, distinct branches of your tripod. That's completely fine. Actually, if your spine tree T is not a breadth such tree, you might even have edges between uh, vertices on the same branch. But that, that's completely fine. So the notion of tripod is really a subgraph. It's not an induced subgraph. So that's how we are going to think about tripods. To be fully precise, I need to mention that there are some degenerate notions of it. Instead of starting with a facial triangle, you might want to start just with an edge. So the base would be just an edge, and in this case, you would have two branches. An even more de degenerated case you would be you start with a single vertex, and then you only have one branch. That's also, we are also going to call them uh, tripods. Uh, but that, these are just degenerated cases. For the purpose of under understanding the proof, just think of tripods as being this. OK. And now we are going to follow this proof here, but we are going to make some adjustments. And uh, I'm not, so we are going to change the star property that we maintain at each step, right? This uh, star property that we maintain about the connected components of the graph at step i, uh, how there should be a nice cycle bonding them with some nice properties. And now I'm going, instead of writing these properties uh, in text, I'm going to illustrate them on the, on the slide. Uh, but first, let me tell you how we start the process. So in the previous proof, we started the process by looking at the outer uh, uh, face, in the outer triangle, and making V1 one vertex and V2 uh, two vertices of that triangle. And now, to start the process, I need to start a bit differently. Uh, actually, it's not important, but let me start the process in this way. I look at the outer triangle of my plane triangulation, and now I make each vertex a, a degenerated tripod. Just a single vertex, I see it as a tripod. Right, so this will be my V1, my V2, and my V3, and everything else is inside. This is how I start the process. And another thing I should mention is that I took first an embedding of my graph where the root is on the outer face, the root of my spanning tree. Right, so think of the root as being on the outer face, and I'm starting the process in this way. Now, let me uh, illustrate what we are going to maintain. Okay, so this picture is means uh, to convey what is the star property that we are going to maintain. The property is that in every comp at every st uh, time step i, i at least 4, um, if you look at any component, connected component d of the current graph, there should be a cycle surrounding it so that your connected component is exactly the subgraph induced by all the vertices strictly inside, right? So you have a cycle surrounding it, but the vertex is joined from it. Your connected component is strictly inside and it's consisting of everything drawn strictly inside. Okay, so that looks a lot like the previous proof. But now we are going to change the fact that in the previous proof we wanted to partition into two paths, the cycle. Now we want to partition the cycle in possibly three paths, so at most three paths. Typically, like in the typical case, it will be three paths. And each of these paths, they should belong to a tripod that you already defined. 
In other words, they should belong to a VJ that was already defined before. Right? So again, let me repeat it. Your connected component lives strictly inside. It's induced by all the vertices strictly inside. And there should be a cycle, a cordless cycle uh, surrounding it, uh, so that it can be partitioned into at most three parts, if each of which uh, is a contained as a subpath, uh, as a subgraph in the tripod that you already defined. I'm not saying that you know this part should be like in a specific branch of your tripod. Like if you look at the red section, this part here is it's spanning two branches, parts of two branches of your tripod. That's fine. In the blue section, it happens to actually use only one branch. That's fine as well. Okay, so this is the star property that we are going to maintain. For every connected component of the current graph, you have this cycle that can be partitioned into these three parts uh, that come from three previous tripods. Does that make sense? Okay, now next step, and I should say that this setup is, I mean, this, is, this proof is exactly an adaptation of uh, the proof of Miho and, and Sebastian. So all the ideas here, they really come from their proof. Uh, so the next, step is we are going to color the vertices inside. So first I'm going to use colors you know, for the, the at most three tripods that I see on my boundary cycle. So I use red, green, blue here. And now for every vertex which is inside, so which is in my connected component that I care about, I look at that vertex and that vertex I look at the uh, rooted spanning tree that I'm playing with. That vertex is well somewhere in my spanning tree. The root is on top. From that vertex V, I can walk up towards the root. When I do that, you know, I'm creating a vertical path. But the root is drawn on the other face. So when I, do, when I look at that vertical path, I'm, I'm, I'm bound to hit the boundary cycle at some point. But maybe the root is there, maybe it's somewhere else, I, I don't know. But I will hit the boundary cycle at some point and I will hit it either in the red or green or blue section. And according to which part, which section I hit, I color that vertex accordingly. Right? So this, this is a way to assign a color in uh, each vertex inside. Right? So in this case, I color this one red. Maybe this vertex will be colored green, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, so every vertex inside is colored red, green, or blue. And now if you look at the graph defined by all the vertices on the cycle and everything inside, that's a near triangulation. Every inner face is a triangle, the outer face might not be. And it's a near triangulation colored with three colors, red, green, blue. The colors on the outer face, they appear consecutively, so you have a bunch of reds, a bunch of greens, a bunch of blues. Every vertex inside is colored red, green, or blue. And then you can use a Spenner's lemma, which is an ID from their proof, which tells you then that there is a facial triangle which sees all three colors, red, green, blue. Okay, so I have this nice uh, facial triangle, red, green, blue. This will be the base of my new tripod, my new VI that I'm defining. Now I start from this red, green, blue triangle. From red, I take the vertical path, <coughs> and I know that uh, towards the root, I know that I will hit the red section because it's a red vertex, and I stop it just before I hit the red section. I do the same for green, I do the same for blue, and these are the three branches of the tripod that I just defined. Right? So this facial triangle together with these three branches is the new tripod that I just defined. This is my new VI. Yes? Generic cases are appear when one of these vertices are on the boundary? Yes. Yes, I was going to mention it exactly now. That's a very good remark. So why do we have to deal with degenerative tripods? It's because, you know, in this picture, I picture the, the Sperner triangle to be completely inside, like three new vertices, three vertices that are strictly inside. But that's not a guarantee of Sperner Senna. You might actually have some vertices on the boundary. And then you have some degenerative cases to play with. It doesn't create any difficulties. And actually, I don't want to, to cover them here. Just know that they exist, and they can be uh, dealt with. It's, uh, it does not create uh, any problem in the proof. But that's a very good remark. So, like, this is how somehow the general case. 
but you might have actually one of these points and two of these vertices uh, on, the, on the boundary. Okay, so we, we define this new tripod. This is our new VR. And now we need to make sure that, you know, this star property is still holding. Uh, so we are going to look at each of the new regions that we define, because, I mean, everything outside, nothing changed there. So for the component, the connected components of the graph at time i plus 1, if these components are outside my bounding site under there, nothing changed for them, so I know that the property is fine for them. So I need to check what happens for connected components that are here, here, or here. And when you see on the picture that in each case you can find a bounding cycle or that you can partition into at most three paths, each of which belongs to a tripod that you already defined. Okay, so that's really the, the gist, the, that's really the, the idea of the proof. As I said, I skipped over uh, some small details, what about the de determinative cases? I don't really want to do them with you because I really just really want to emphasize what, what's the main idea. Is the idea clear? Okay, so that's how you define the new VI. Yes. Why are the branches of the new tripod Why are they disjoint? That's a very good question. So let's uh, see why they are disjoint. So this is the branch from this red vertex. Why is this vertex red? It's because when you look at the vertical path towards the root, you go up, go up the tree, and you hit the red section. So it means that on this branch, all these vertices, they must be colored red. Because if you look at any vertex there, and you go up towards the tree, well, there is no choice. You always go to your parent. And uh, eventually, you hit the red section. So all the vertices on, on the branch here are red vertices. All the vertices here are green vertices. So the, the branches are really vertex destroyed. Yeah, is that convincing? Okay, so yeah, I defined a new uh, VI, that's my new tripod, and, and then the proof proceeds in this way. So I hand-wavely convinced you, hopefully, that this star property that I illustrated on this picture is uh, holding at each step, so we can proceed. Um, so why is uh, the trivial of the quotient graph, why is it um, at most three? Well, think of what's happening in the minor, where you contract the tripod. You can think of this minor as being built one step at a time. Each time you create a new VI, well, contract it, and you make it adjacent to the VJs it's in before, and that, those VJs, that's a click, right? In this case, these are the three VJs, that's a triangle, and each time you create a new VI, well, you know, it's, uh, you make it adjacent to three VJs, so you have three with three. Right, so it's a, it's a true color partition here. Uh, no more questions about uh, the proof? Okay, let me continue then. Okay, so that's, that was the heart of the proof. Uh, so if you have a plane triangulation, a rooted spanning tree, you have a color partition into tripods so that the cushion graph has trimmed at most three. Now, I promised you that this would actually imply this previous theorem that we discussed. Let's, let's quickly see why that's the case. Well, in this theorem, we want to partition into vertical paths, not into tripods. But we have some looseness, we have some freedom in the trivial bound. We are happy to increase the bound there. So in, since we want to partition into vertical paths and not into tripods, the strategy is obvious. Uh, instead of having a VI between being one uh, tripod, you split it up in its branches. And this would be the vertical paths that you use. Okay. Now it's no longer a codal partition because you are losing some, some adjacencies. Um, but it's a vertex partition. And the tree width bound, I'm just going to sketch it because I think wait, there are only four minutes left. <laughs> So the tree width bound, why is the tree at most 8? Well, you can maintain a tree decomposition uh, as, as you go when you build these, uh, these uh, tripods. Uh, and the property that you're going to maintain is that in each bounding cycle, like the red, green, blue cycle, 
you always have a bag in your 3D composition that contains the, the vertical paths that appear on the bounding side. So here there should be a bag that contains this vertical path, this vertical path, this vertical path, this one, and this one. And this is in your minor, right? So this vertical path, they get contracted to a vertex. So it should contain this vertex, this vertex, this vertex, this vertex, and this vertex. In this case, it's a five vertices. It could be up to six in case you, you were seeing two paths from group. So that's the property that we are going to maintain at each step. Now, how do we modify the, the 3D composition? Well, when I define my new tripod here, I'm defining three new vertical paths. I have this special bag that accommodates my bounding cycle in my 3D composition. I create a child bag where I keep all these uh, vertical paths into my bag, or the vertices corresponding to them, and I add these three. So I possibly had six, and I had three, so, and I add three, so possibly I create a bag of size up to nine. Right? And three width is you know, maximum bag size minus one, so this is where the eight comes from. So I create a child bag with up to nine vertical paths in there, or more precisely, the vertices resulting from the contraction of up to nine vertical paths. And then I will create, a, for that child bag, I will create you know, children for each of these regions here. And for each of these regions, I will create a child where I will put exactly the, the vertical paths that appear on the boundary. And so again, I will have up to six vertical paths there, or more precisely, six vertices resulting from the contraction of this uh, vertical path. And in this way, I build inductively my, my 3D composition, and I make sure that every bag has size at most uh, nine, so I have three at most eight. So that's how you get the, the previous result. Um, right, so now I should really stop because that's uh, the end of the time. So in conclusion, that's the product structure already met a couple of times. Now, what I wanted to mention is that the tripod version actually gives you a variant of the product structure, which is the following. That every planograph is a subgraph of H times P times a triangle, where H is a planograph. It has three at most three, and P is some path. So your H will be the quotient graph when you contract the tripod. Okay, so you need to check that to get this product structure, this will be the first exercise this afternoon, but this, get, this is really a consequence of the tripod version. And in most applications, actually, we apply these versions instead of this one because we have a, a better bond on the tree. So thanks a lot for your attention. Questions? <laughs> yes, there is a question. Can this uh, eight be uh, improved? Or yes, yes, I'm going to mention it in a couple of lectures, but the short answer is yes. The best known bound for this version here uh, is six. And we know that it should be at least three. There are examples forcing three. Uh, and so it's between three and six. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment that uh, when you are doing this uh, uh, true rebound, it's nice to think about this as Cobson proper game. In the sense that uh, if you think about bounding the truth of this quotient graph, this means playing the game in the original graph where, for example, one cop can guard the whole tripod. And then you can just play this free guy on those tripods, and then the fourth guy comes puts on this middle tripod and then you can record where, see where the rover is and record the, uh, the record. Yeah, that's a very nice way to see it. Thanks.